It's Sunday, November 3, 2024. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we make the time to consider the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Our guest today is a professor of history at NYU, a world renowned expert on authoritarianism and author of Strongmen from Mussolini to the Present. She publishes a Substack newsletter entitled Lucid about threats to democracy. Ruth Ben Giat, welcome back to the weekend show. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be speaking with you again. We're just two days away from the general election, uh, a special general election, I, I call it. But the race is neck and neck, surprisingly, considering that one party in Donald Trump is, to all intents and purposes, a self-proclaimed dictator. Why is this happening in a nation that prides itself on being the world's greatest democracy? I think uh, the toll of disinformation, uh, we have to talk about that. And um, you know, back in 2016, people were ready for somebody like Trump. My research shows that whenever there's a society that's made a lot of progress and could be workers' rights, uh, gender equity, racial equity, that <clears throat> prepares the ground for a backlash. Um, but now we're, we've had, you know, eight years, uh, almost uh, since nine years, really, since Trump came down the escalator. And he has been extraordinarily effective as a propagandist um, and that uh, one of his end games has been to really make Americans feel that uh, democracy is failing and using disinformation despite the robust economy to make people feel that America is failing and, and thus democracy doesn't work and that perhaps some kind of authoritarian uh, governance would be better, which is why he's also been praising dictators for uh, almost a decade. In, in your career, you've written about dictators of history. And I suppose when you were writing Strong Men, and you were obviously there is a chapter about Trump as a potential threat to democracy, but mostly you're talking about the, the Putins and the Pinochets of this world. Did you ever think in your lifetime? as an academic, that you would actually have to be having these conversations as you are now and potentially writing another book? Because it, to me, as somebody who moved to Barack Obama's America, this, what we're living through now, was unfathomable. It's unfathomable, but if you know the patterns of history, no country is immune from this. And when you have the right kind of charismatic demagogue come along, and when that person is able to capture a party, and we're, we're particularly vulnerable if you look at things comparatively, like globally, because other nations have multi-party systems. And so if one party becomes captured by an autocrat, it's called autocratic capture, where the party becomes the personal tool of the demagogue, other parties can kind of band together and uh, have a, an opposition coalition and, and get rid of them. <clears throat> that happened in 2023 in Poland. A six-party coalition uh, was able to, to help get rid of the far-right government. But we only have two parties, and we're an extraordinarily large nation, and these parties are large and powerful. And Trump has been able to get from local politicians, the city, municipal level, up to powerful senators to uh, be his personal tools, even defend uh, the January 6th insurrection that left them running for their lives and targeted a, a Republican vice president for, for, for death. These are things that sound like they're out of a political thriller, but it has happened here. And that is why um, we are in the situation we're in today. I, I guess it doesn't help that there isn't a huge kind of political discourse in, in society that, you know, people are busy, they're working. America is also famously uneducated. It does not rank high in the, in the kind of education stats. So really, there is a very large number of what they call low information voters, as much as I, I hate that phrase, who are not engaged with politics on a day to day basis and are really only thinking about it in the last few weeks before the election, if at all. 
I mean, how much of that is a, is a problem for the United States? And is there some kind of master plan that actually to keep it that way? Because there are theories that say that they don't want people to be smarter and mm-hmm. educated for, for exactly this reason. Well, there's a reason that uh, Republican, you know, states have always voted against education. And there's a really good reason that uh, wrecking public education, like public schools, which are really laboratories of democracy, they're places where children come together of different backgrounds, different races, different faiths, and civics is taught. And these are things that are very threatening to authoritarians. Uh, and so you know, trying to wreck the public school system. Think of who has become a target. Um, Anybody, it's really, the big big picture is that anybody who uh, deals in facts and verifiable evidence, empirical, you know, reality, whether it's scientists, uh, academics like myself, um, you know, prosecutors who make their judgments based on facts, judges, journalists, of course, a very wide group of people who always become the targets of authoritarians because authoritarians traffic in lies um, and, and lies become state dogma and party dogma. And we've seen this happen here and it's been able to happen because of uh, the lower level, not just of education in America, but engagement. Um, I'm always haunted by the fact that tens of millions of people didn't vote in 2016. I think it was like 80 million people <clears throat> almost the same in 2020. They're not engaged at all in politics. And so these are the people who famously uh, existed in other pl- times and other places. And these are the people who wake up and only when it's too late and realize they've got their freedoms have, have been taken away and they weren't paying attention. And we've heard from Donald Trump and his surrogates that the Department of Education is actually one of the first departments that they would shut down. I mean, they're actually saying that stuff out loud. And a lot of this is detailed in Project 2025, which, as we know, is the Heritage Foundation's plan for for leadership, which basically forms Trump's manifesto. I mean, he doesn't really have much else that isn't aligned with that. So that's the most surprising thing to me. And even Kamala Harris has said, can you believe they actually wrote it down? So, so, so shutting the Department of, of Education, aside from other departments which currently keep us safe, the Environmental Protection Agency is one of them, and certainly the Department of Health and Human Services. I mean, they want to they take a, what was the phrase that Mike Johnson used? He wanted to take a blowtorch to the regulatory state. Mm-hmm. I mean, they are not hiding the, the extremism, and we're just supposed to just sit and wait for this to happen. Yeah, there's a lot to say here. The, on the issue of not hiding it, um, this is a psychological warfare tactic that uh, Trump has always engaged in. Bannon, Steve Bannon, who's you know been a, a kind of uh, behind-the-scenes strategist of all this since 2015, even before, believes that you should uh, beat people over the head with what you tell them is going to happen to them. And authoritarians often do tell you what they're going to do to you because the goal there is to make you feel helpless. And it goes with propping up the cult, the personality cult of the strongman, making him feel him seem omnipotent. Um, of course, then he's suing and threatening, so you're afraid to push back. And so the idea is that whatever it is on whatever subject that they like to do, however extreme, you feel there's nothing you can do to stop it, and it's dangerous to try. So, so that's that's what's been going on. Um, now, on the subject of education, we have to now introduce the the ideal of making America a white Christian nation. And so, when you want to, um, you know, crash public schools and 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 get rid of the Department of Education, you, it's a scheme, as I said before, to um, rec public education, which is where multi-faith, multi-racial, you know, laboratory of civics happens. And instead, you have vouchers, you privatize education. Privatization and deregulation are the pillars of Project 2025. And you have people homeschooled. That's a big thing in uh, religious households, Christian nationalist households, or they go to Christian schools. Um, so that's part of this, the, you know, they're thinking long term. 
Um, and that's important for people to remember. You know, Trump personally may be all over the place, repeating himself. He's got cognitive decline. But he has a method in his, as a propagandist, and the people backing him, whether they're at Heritage or the Federalist or all the other places that are part of Project 2025, they have a long-term plan to shift the culture, the political culture and the culture of America to make it um, a kind of white Christian ethnostate. So that schooling, schooling is always very important. I wrote about it in my book for the Nazis, the fascists, what Pinochet did to universities after the coup in Chile. Um, he had the, he had, you know, he had huge purges and uh, rectors of universities were military officers. They always target education. So interesting, isn't it? That it, it's it's been written before. The story's been written before, and and we feel like they are coming up with it, you know, on the fly. And actually, this this follows a, a, an authoritarian pattern. But is is Trump not turning out to be a useful idiot for for these organisations that are behind these policy proposals? Because it is clear now. Obviously, he's seventy eight years of of age. He he has clear cognitive decline. Aside from his personality disorders, he's demented, and so this in itself is not going to mean he's he's mean he's not going to be around for very long as a leader potentially. Even though I'm sure he'd like to serve two or three or unlimited number of terms. So, do you do you think that there is anything like that going on? Because there is a theory that J D Vance is actually the the key to Project 2025's. Um, you know, growth, and and actually they're relying on, on Trump, just getting them through the door, and then they can lay out their store. Yeah, I mean, uh, Trump is still very formidable as a propagandist. He truly is. I'm, I'm going to say something that people think sounds weird, but um, he is one of the most uh, uh, skilled propagandists in history. And why do I say this? And I have a chapter on propaganda in my book that goes over 100 years. I teach a class on propaganda, so uh, I, I've studied this for a long time. So when we think about how somebody is able to convince tens of millions of people um, to believe a very easy to verify lie, like who won the 2020 election, the, the mass deception at that scale, he's got, what is it? 20, 40 million people believe this. He did this not in a one-party state like Mussolini and, and Hitler and all the others, or even something like Putin, where journalists are constantly getting killed. He was able to convince these people um, in a working in a democracy with a totally pluralistic media environment. And, and so he should never be discounted. Um, and the, the strength of the bond people have with him is is also very important. And he's also wily. Um, when, you know, you, when he had, when the assassination attempt happened in uh, Pennsylvania, this was very interesting to me uh, as somebody who studies autocrats, because these are durable people who react to crises in a different way than most people. So most people, you know, they, they were shot at whatever the reality was, if it was a shrapnel, what hit his ear? We, we do not know but he went down. Most people would have uh, allowed the Secret Service to take them to safety. You've got to get off into safety. Everyone knows that. He had the wherewithal to make it an iconic moment because he's a man of images. He truly understands images very, very well. And so he rose up exposing his face, exposing his, his whole side and his arm uh, and and did the iconic fight, 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 and the fist, thus making uh, an iconic moment, which also was reassuring his followers that he was okay and he was going to endure. So from that point of view of, of, of personality cult, he, he should never be discounted. That said, yes, he's because of all this, he's getting uh, people through the door, as you said. And then other... Uh, other partners of this enterprise uh, surely have their eye on Vance, who is a very smooth, very smart, a total fanatic, total ideological fanatic, who's very close to Kevin Roberts and the rest of the 2025 gang. Uh, he wrote the foreword to Kevin Roberts' now delayed uh, you know, book. 
So, and he has extreme views, as we all know, we've heard, uh, he's an extreme misogynist, uh, really pu views people as uh, kind of assets to a state where women would be tools of demographic schemes. Um, and, and he said that he would, you know, deport uh, uh, undocumented immigrants and as well as people who are U.S. citizens. It does, he said it doesn't matter if they're citizens. So this is somebody who is, is a total authoritarian, very frightening, and it's no wonder that he was placed there uh, by Peter Thiel and the other very powerful billionaires who want to carry this forward into the future. Um, so in that sense, your analysis, yes, is correct, but we also should never count out uh, Donald Trump because these, these, these guys have third and fourth and fifth lives. I, I was going to say... It, it... Most people of Trump's disposition and constitution and physicality might not have made it to 78, but he, he does seem to have multiple lives. Can I, I just go back to the shooting for a second before we move on to J.D. Vance? Because it was Mark Zuckerberg, when interviewed recently, who again is another one of these oligarchs, very powerful people in the world as the owner of Meta and Facebook and Instagram and all, the, all these other worlds that we live in. And he said that when Donald Trump got up and, and punched the air, he thought that was badass and, mm -hmm. and effectively endorsed him mm -hmm. based upon that moment. Mm -hmm. And this is what is so very worrying, isn't it? That a lot of these oligarch types, and I think it's important that we in America start to refer to people like Zuckerberg and, and Musk as oligarchs. It's not exclusive to, you know, the former Soviet Union. And so, you know, again, that just leans support further to Donald Trump's cause so that people forget about the specifics, the insurrection, the theft of classified documents, mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And they just focus on the fact that he did, he was like a superhero in the moment. That's right. And that's why I was um, emphasizing the power of his personality cult. And it's just very interesting, like, to just give an example um, from somewhere else. In 2016, um, in Turkey, when uh, there was a coup um, against uh, Erdogan, trying to, uh, a military coup, trying to get rid of him. And Turkey is a place that's been many, many coups. But, uh, and he was on vacation uh, uh, on the coast somewhere. And so they came to get him. It's not clear how he knew, but he, he went somewhere into hiding a safe place and then he called in to, instead of keeping quiet, he called in to, to CNN Turk and he was put on the anchors. Uh, he used FaceTime. And so his little face uh, was on the screen held by the phone of the anchor at CNN Turk. And he made an appeal to the Turkish people to go out into the streets and defeat the military coup. So not everybody would have done that. And so what these guys do is they, they use their, they, they're, they're survivalists and self-preservation uh, is, is when they're at their best and most creative. And so uh, he, he was a, by doing this, he seemed like the hero and everybody poured into the streets and then the coup disintegrated. And so I thought about that and other episodes with Mussolini. Um, Mussolini, you know, he had many uh, assassination attempts against him. At, at the very beginning, and that's why he declared dictatorship. But he went around with a bandage on his nose. Um, and, and instead of hiding away, he had a photo opportunity with the bandage on the nose. And I thought of that, of course, when uh, Trump showed up with his ear bandage. So this isn't new. It's our turn to be living through this dynamics, but they're very powerful. They, they elicit very powerful emotional bonds and reactions. And so that's why, despite everything, his conv he's a convicted felon, he's an adjudicated rapist, he is still there. It is remarkable. And maybe the bandage is a kind of metaphor to confirm everything that you're saying, because the bandage was not necessary. He was photographed playing yeah. golf the day before without a bandage. It, 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 is a, it was a propaganda bandage. Mm -hmm. But it worked because so many people at the RNC were also wearing bandages to match in solidarity with their supreme leader. Exactly. And that's the kind of group dynamics that 
keeps the personality cult going. And, and the other thing that's extraordinary, not only got, you know, tens of millions to believe that he won the election, the guy's been out of power for years yeah. and, and he's kind of old and washed up. And yet he's treated by people as though he's still the rightful leader. And it's very, and, and this extends to foreign affairs. When I'm very struck by uh, two times, Viktor Orban, his big partner, um, the head of Hungary, has come to the States now, who does he visit? Of course, he doesn't visit President Biden because he's snubbing democratic America. Where does he go? He goes to Mar-a-Lago to kiss the ring of Trump, who's like a, almost like he's a, a, a spurned president in, in internal exile. And Mar-a-Lago is like the, the bunker of internal exile. So he goes there. And then he goes to the Heritage Foundation, which has been like a shadow government in waiting. And that goes back to what we're talking about. Why are they so open with everything they want to do, right? And and so so this this is why Donald Trump hasn't gone away because he's been treated like the rightful president, not just by his deluded followers, but by people like Viktor Orban and all these elites who, yes, are using him for sure, but it's a mutual using. And that's that's the same with all the autocrats I've studied from Mussolini onward. They use each other. And then some people get burned. They, they think they never expect that things are going to become so radical and so violent. Um, but by then they've signed on. It's hard to detach yourself. This can actually be quite dangerous, though, having this shadow government that Trump pretending he's still the president wears the badge People call him Mr. President, has the the vehicles and the security, the Secret Service. I mean, all yeah. the stuff that goes with that. Because he met with Benjamin Netanyahu. And yeah. there were rumors that he basically, because they have a kind of uh, an authoritarian bond, he, he basically potentially said to him, no ceasefire before the election. I mean, that appears to be playing out as well. And that is off the back of a, an active conflict that the United States is involved in in, in, the, in in Gaza. I mean, that is very serious and surprising to me that that hasn't broken any conventions of American law that would prevent Trump from even seeking re-election. You, yes, you're right. And he's also been speaking to Putin regularly. Right. Um, and I really see him... Uh, so I start my book with um, uh, the, the prologue is about uh, Berlusconi and Putin. And Berlusconi was a Putin partner. Um, and before Berlusconi, there was uh, Gerhard Schroeder in Germany. And these are partners because Putin has always depended on foreign uh, leaders to be his mouthpieces and to um, get his ideas across in, in European uh security meetings, and, and he depends on these heads of state. I see Trump as the same. He's, he's a partner uh, of, of Putin. And everything that he's proposing to do, uh, getting out of NATO, withdrawing troops, um, benefits uh, Putin's view of the world. And, and so, it, you know, this is, this is important. And so he, and it's not just Putin, there's this kind of autocratic axis that's shaping up. North Korean soldiers are now fighting, uh, you know, for Russia and Ukraine. And, and so Trump is inserted into all of this. He's long been an ally of Netanyahu. I saw a quote the other day where, uh, yes, he was telling him, now he says, if I get into office, you're going to wrap up this war. Because one of his lines is that he is the peacemaker. Right. Um, your, your audience should watch out for this because this has been a big scam that all these autocrats are, um, are kind of promulgating. Uh, you know, Orban, Orban keeps having this uh, hashtag peace when he goes to see Putin. So war is peace. The autocrats are the peacemakers. And the line is that only Trump can prevent World War III because Trump has the ear of the autocrats and he can tell them what to do. Now, this is ludicrous. Um, Trump is uh, a, a client, really, of Putin um, and, and, and was paid by the Chinese uh, millions of dollars while he was uh, president. We know this documented in the Times and the Post. So, um, but this is what he's using to sell himself to Americans 
this World War III business and that only Trump can prevent it versus the globalist warmongers. That's a ban and phrase that's now like very active around the world. It's the globalist warmongers. That's, you could be in the 1930s, the globalist shorthand right. for Jews, of course. I mean, Steve Bannon, we should probably mention because he was released from prison about a week ago. Uh, he defied a subpoena. He went to jail. He has another case coming up where he fraudulently took money from people for this kind of build the wall foundation that he'd created. He, he, as you said earlier, is very much the architect of a lot of this chaos about flooding the, mm -hmm. the market with, with noise, with, with information or disinformation, so that people don't really know what to think or who to believe and consequently who to vote for. And, and, and when Trump can then come along and say, well, these are all the problems and I alone can fix it, mm -hmm. then they, it's an easier option for them to just put their safety in the hands of Donald Trump, the, the, the despot, rather than have to actually do any work, read any policy documents or take any interest in, in, in the kind of political sphere. So the timing of Steve Bannon's release from prison is a little frustrating, isn't it? Because, you know, he's straight back into his War Room podcast. He's straight back into sowing this, this information, this disinformation. And it, it really is, he is like a clear and present danger. And yet he has a huge army of fans, not least Donald Trump. He's always been a huge danger. Um, I wrote a piece for CNN Opinion um, right after uh, Trump was inaugurated and it was called Trump and Bannon's Coup in the Making. And it was about Bannon's uh, idea of dismantling the administrative state and flooding the zone, not only with disinformation, but chaos, making chaos. And that goes straight into Project 2025. So an important point is that, you know, Bannon is an extremist. Uh, he wears rumpled, you know, he looks disheveled. Yeah. Uh, um, He's really a fascist, uh, also a Leninist. He's, you know, he's, he's a revolutionary in his own way. He's a, a chaos agent. And so it can seem like he's very different than, uh, for example, Kevin Roberts, who wears suits and is the CEO of the Heritage Foundation. But they're very close. And Roberts goes on, uh, he was going on uh, Steve Bannon's War Room podcast. If you read Project 2025, it says Bannon things, like dismantling yeah. the administrative state. That's been a Bannon goal since uh, when I wrote that piece, since 2016-17. So Bannon is at the center of all this. He also works internationally. You know, he moved to Italy for a while, and he was trying to have um, a kind of training university for right-wing operatives, and then it, it, that didn't work out. But he advised Bolsonaro before Bolsonaro did his January 8th insurrection uh, uh, copycat thing. So he's very dangerous uh, both within the U.S. and also because of the reach of his ideas. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's very scary to have him out, but we have to realize that it's not that he's over here and the upstanding Project 2025 people are over here. They're they're all extremists. What, what, they're, they're one of the same. We yes. have to take a, a quick break, but mm -hmm. I want to come back and, and talk about the word fascist because Vice President, President Harris has actually now, in the last couple of weeks before the election, started to use the word fascist to describe her opponent. We'll do that next here on The Weekend Show. I'm excited to tell you about Moink. That's Moo plus Oink. Moink is a meat subscription box company on a mission to fight for the family farm. They're located in rural America, run by an eighth-generation female farmer, their animals are raised humanely, their employees are paid a living wage, and the quality of their product is better than anything you'll find in a store. Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and sustainable wild-caught Alaskan salmon straight to your door. Moink farmers farm like our grandparents did, and as a result, Moink meat tastes like it should, because the family farm does it better, and the Moink difference is a difference you can taste. 
Unlike the supermarket, Moik gives you total control over the quality and source of your food. You can choose the meat delivered in every box, like ribeyes to chicken breasts, pork chops to salmon fillets, and much more. Plus, you can cancel any time. Moik is helping to save rural America. Join the Moik movement today. Keep American farming going by signing up at moinkbox.com slash weekend right now. And listeners to this show get free hot rolls in your first box. The best hot rolls you'll ever taste, but for a limited time. Spelt M-O-I-N-K box.com slash weekend. That's moinkbox.com slash weekend. Today's episode is brought to you by Ali. Clean, fresh nutrition your dog needs in five flavors they'll absolutely flip over. You don't have to be a veterinary nutritionist to know that feeding your dog real whole foods with minimal processing is one of the best choices you can make for their health. A perfectly portioned whole fresh diet has been proven to extend your pup's life by two and a half years. Who doesn't want more time with their best friend? With absolutely no harmful fillers, no preservatives, Ali is made in U.S. kitchens with ingredients carefully sourced from trusted growers and producers around the world. With five protein-first recipes like fresh beef with sweet potato, fresh turkey with blueberries, fresh lamb with cranberries, you might start thinking, dang, my dog eats better than I do. And that's probably true when it comes to Ali. Fill out Ali's 30-second quiz and they'll create a customized meal plan based on your pup's weight, activity level and other health info. Ali crunches the numbers and recommends the right recipes and daily portions for your precious pup based on hundreds of thousands of real dog results. Right now, Ali is offering a fantastic deal to let your pup taste test a personalized meal plan. So head to Ali.com, tell them about your dog, use Weekend, and you'll get 60% off your first box of meals when you subscribe today. Head to O-L-L-I-E dot com and enter code WEEKEND to get 60% off your first box. They offer a clean bowl guarantee. On their first box, if you're not completely satisfied, you can get your money back. We're back on The Weekend Show with Ruth ben Gatt. I'm Anthony Davis. Vice President Harris has called the disgraced former President Trump a fascist. She did it at a CNN town hall a week or so ago at, uh, in, in Pennsylvania, echoing his one-time chief of staff's criticism as she makes a more vocal pitch to voters that he is unfit for office. Of course, she's referring to John Kelly, who is the retired four-star Marine general who was Trump's longest-serving White House chief of staff. And he came forward to warn that his former boss meets the general definition of a fascist. Ruth, this is the, a word that is you know, rarely used, especially at this level. And, and it, we shouldn't think of it as normal for a political leader, especially one who is in office as vice president, to actually use it against her opponent unless it's absolutely true. I mean, and, and that really, to me, was the, the seriousness of this whole storyline. Because I've been calling him, as you have, a fascist for almost a decade. But for, for Vice President Harris to say it, what did, what did it mean when you first heard that? So the reason she was saying it is that um, uh, General Mark Milley, uh, had, uh, the retired uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, thus not a radical leftist or... <laughs> Uh, an anarchist, subversive, uh, Antifa type, had used it to refer to Trump, saying uh, both he's a total fascist and also that he's fascist to the core. Pretty yeah. strong statements. Then, uh, you know, General Kelly used the word, um, and General Kelly was uh, Trump's G chief of staff and so had an, a daily insight into Trump's adulation of Hitler and wanting, famously wanting U.S. generals to act like Hitler's generals. And so Kelly tried to tell him that actually Hitler's generals tried to kill him several times, which is also documented in my book. Um, but, um, and then uh, de former Defense Secretary Mark Esper, again, not a radical leftist, um, used the word. And so when Vice President Harris was asked about these references, she said, they, you know, the, the interviewer said, can we, can we call him a fascist? And she said, yes. 
So it created um, a, an opening to use this word. Um, I myself did not use the word for a long time. With Trump, I used authoritarian. And that's because, of course, there's so many things that are taken straight from fascism um, that Trump does and says. But uh, he's equally enamored of communist dictators, uh, right. whether it's Kim of North Korea or Xi of China. And he's, he's not just enamored of their personalities. He talks about, oh, Chinese justice system is so great. You can have somebody executed in a few hours, you know. So it seemed to be reductive to call him a fascist because while inside countries, left and right mean something, um, at the highest level of corrupt authoritarian power, left or right don't have much meaning, which is why, for example, the, fa the fascistic Putin is allied right now with um, Xi Jinping, communist dictator, and communist troops from North Korea are fighting in Ukraine for fascist Putin. So those distinctions um, lose a little of their meaning, whether the right and left stuff. And so Trump fits in there. Um, and they're all, you know, Anne Applebaum's new book, they're, they're connected. It's above ideology. So, so anyway, that's why I personally, um, even though I've written two books on fascism, uh, before strongmen, I didn't use the word. But it's very, it's very important to use the word in our domestic context because, you know, he, he complained, he doesn't like people calling him a fascist. Indeed, he sued CNN in 2022. Um, for uh, saying that people were comparing him to Hitler. Um, and my work, uh, something, uh, an op-ed I did was mentioned like on page one of the legal complaint. But um, he's the one who is talking, using the language of Nazism. He even made a campaign ad where he says, I'm going to be, you know, where they said he's going to be recreating a unified Reich, yes. using the word Reich. I mean, yes. we, on and on with the examples we could draw and the Madison Square Garden rally. So, so fascism, which, you know, it, it doesn't happen the same way today because true, the, the classic fascist dictatorships were one-party states. So today we, we, don't, we, we don't have as many one-party states outside communist dictatorships. Um, but it's important to make that label because what he wants is absolute power he he wants to shut down any opposition to himself. He wants to send political opponents a, a large variety of targets, journalists, political opponents, uh, to prison. Or uh, the other day talked about Liz Cheney should have guns trained on her, you know, yes. talking about firing squads. This is all fascist. He probably couldn't define fascism versus communism versus Marxism or any of the isms that he often accuses Kamala Harris of being. Projection is very much a theme in, in Donald Trump's armory, isn't it? And, and you know, she, he's now saying that she's unhinged and that she's dumb. And he's actually talking about himself. And that's what the psychologists say. You just reverse everything that he says. These are actually his insecurities. And when he says mm -hmm. she doesn't know anything about anything, Mm -hmm. He deep down knows that he doesn't know anything about anything. And and I found that very interesting when interviewing the, the psychiatrists. And and that's a whole other topic because the, the media just won't go there when it comes to the kind of psychiatric analysis of, of him. But we do know that he's a malignant narcissist. We know about this personality disorder, the ego, the self-absorbed nature of his of his shadow presidency as well as his former presidency. But what about the people that he has successfully brainwashed, who also don't necessarily understand the definitions of the isms, but say, well, I'm voting for Trump because Kamala Harris is a Marxist or she's mm -hmm. a communist or a socialist. I mean, he has had some success with the repetition of these mm -hmm. isms. Yeah, and that's why uh, it's very important to recognize his skills as a propagandist and uh, the toll of disinformation, which is where we started. And none of this would have been possible without Fox News, yes. which it, it, it carries out the principle of repetition. So, so propaganda. There's a couple of like principles, and and they have they meaning Trump and Fox and all of the lackeys in the GOP. They've really put this. They've been very good about putting these into action. One is repetition, 
<clears throat> you have to have the same message with tiny variations um, so it doesn't seem stale, repeated. And, and so that's how the conditioning uh, comes forth. Because really the aim of these authoritarians is it's not about getting you to believe this lie or that lie. Um, it's about changing the associations you make with groups that are targeted, thus the immigrants, they're eating cats and dogs, they're spreading disease, you know, on and on and on. Um, or Jews, he said stuff about Jews being cheap, but the globalists. So, and that's of course comes from Hitler, right? And Mussolini later. So it's about changing your worldview. And for that, the repetition is, is very, very important, as well as believing that truth, um, that it's only the strong man who's the arbiter of truth. And he's been able to do that. And that's where the um, elite uh, enablers, the collaborators, the Fox News hosts, all the GOP, even up to recently, Glenn Youngkin of Virginia gets on TV and says, oh, yes, he, he won the election in 2020. They keep repeating the lies. And so, it, and, and you, you have to have, like, it's not just the top tier. You have to have the lie trickle down. And so people who are uh, trusted in, in communities, maybe um, a, a town council member, they will repeat the lie. And that's how you keep, you keep the lie going. And that's how you, you get like the, the millions of people, the foot soldiers, the followers to, to keep believing these lies, even over after years. It's, it's extraordinary. Um, but it's all, it all stems from uh, the control of the party and um, the complicity of the media. Once those bargains and deals are made, you have a structure to get the lies um, in order, let's say. The, the lie that hurts me the most is when he points at the press at his rallies and says, there yeah. they all are, the fake news they're the enemy of the people. They won't show the crowd size, all that, all that stuff. But, you know, he's been saying that for so long now that this kind of fake news mantra has embedded itself into the modern vernacular. And it's insane because that has really fueled his ability to create this upside down world where we don't know what is true. And, mm -hmm. and living in these social media information silos means that he has almost successfully created a, a duality of realities. Mm -hmm. So he might yes. have lost the election, but yet only in your reality, but in, in someone else's reality, with their social media algorithm, he won. That's right. And, and that's how you got people to be so invested in his fake reality that they were willing to get arrested and go to the Capitol on January right. 6th and save him. Because January 6th, the way I see it, it was many things, but it was a leader rescue operation. He mm. called them to the ellipse. He said, if you don't fight like hell, you won't have a country anymore. It was, it was a personal um, rescue for him. And they, they responded. And that's actually talking about narcissists. That's why he refers to, disgustingly to January 6th as a day of love. Because yeah. for the narcissist, what better proof of love for him? That's all he cares about is that he's controlling people. And um, what better proof of love that these thousands and thousands of people uh, did this for him? And, and so it's very sick. It's a, it's a very sick and destructive. And unfortunately for us, when I did this research for strongmen, I found that while the outcomes are different, of course, we're not Idi Amin's, you know, country or Gaddafi's Libya. Unfortunately, the personality types are the same. And uh, Trump matches up on uh, all the metrics with uh, other dictators who have uh, done huge, huge damage and brought tragedy on their countries. But this is also why the loss of expertise in analysis both the mental health professionals and, and the kind of history experts like yourself, because we don't rely on expertise and opinion has kind of become the, you know, the leading barometer, especially on, the, on these news channels, 
I mean, the psychologists and the historians will tell you, of course he didn't intervene when January 6th was going on. Of course he enjoyed watching it on television. Of course he spent three hours just, you know, it was probably the favorite, his most favorite show that he's ever seen other than documentary on whales. And, and so I really, you know, wish that we enabled experts to kind of come into the, 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 the discourse and actually guide us as opposed to just news people with an opinion because we need to stop judging him by moral standards. If the guy is mentally ill, if the guy is following these patterns of authoritarianism, then people like yourself and the psychiatrists can tell us exactly what he's doing and what his next move is. Yeah, and I think the the two situations are slightly different in that um, the psychiatrist, the, you know, there was the, the Goldwater rule and they're not supposed, so the, the discipline of psychiatry had, had a problem with um, members of their profession speaking out. History doesn't have that. And um, although uh, if you take the path that I have um, and 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 go on TV frequently and do media to, I decided in 2016 I, I, after Trump said I could stand on Fifth Avenue and shoot someone and, and I wouldn't lose any followers, I, I really did decide that I had a skill set uh, that I could educate people. And so that started all my writing for CNN and then later being on TV. So, so historians, also Timothy Snyder, we've been able to, to go on, uh, not on all uh, networks, but we've been able to be out there. Um, now there's a price in some ways. Sometimes you're you're considered uh, uh, less uh, professional or less academic uh, if you do those things. There are people who will look down on you. But uh, for myself, that I, I don't care <laughs> because it's too vital to to save our democracy and that the, this is my own small contribution educating people to the authoritarian playbook as it's unfolding. Because it's very difficult for people to, to grasp what's going on. And especially if things are scary, um, it, it's easy to just disengage. And, and there we go back to what we were saying before, you, you wake up only when it's too late. Um, I want to just set the record straight about the Goldwater rule, because this is something that is often misunderstood. The Goldwater rule was, you know, has been abused in recent years. And this is the American Psychiatric Association coming forward and saying, you know, the Goldwater rule says that you can't diagnose Trump from a distance and all that stuff. And that's why the media didn't allow the psychiatrists to kind of come on and, and, and talk about his mental health. But actually, none of that is based in fact either. I mean, the, 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 the APA was given a huge donation by the Trump, the, the Trump administration in order to, you know, push this, that there is nothing to say that you can't diagnose someone such as Donald Trump from a distance, considering that he has been interviewed a million times and is always, you know, on television, and that actually if he was in a session with a psychiatrist, he would behave in a very different way specifically for that, for that moment. And so I do think that all of us, we need to kind of stop thinking that the Goldwater rule is, is an excuse for for, but effectively, psychiatry has been shut down by the media for you know, no good reason. Yeah, no, I can't comment not being a psychiatrist on that professional. Uh, it's, it's a loss because there's very important things to, to learn. Um, and when a damaged individual, th this was, you know, the reason that... <laughs> I can say that the reason that authoritarians uh, spend so much time, uh, including hiring foreign public relations firms to depict their governments as efficient and getting things done, the trains will run on time like in fascist Italy, is that behind the scenes, because they are so damaged, they're just about loyalty and retribution and and a lot of them have, you know, uh, you know substance abuse problems or sex addictions. It's it's a it's it's a clown show. They're constantly hiring and firing people. It's the opposite of efficiency. I can tell you that um, right. that that I didn't know how dysfunctional um, behind the scenes this was, and it's a pattern. Um, yeah. 
Well, we've seen it with Trump. The, he's exactly. not being endorsed by any of his former uh, appointees. And exactly. And he's had to get a new vice presidential candidate. I mean, that in itself is also another example of how he, you know, even even Mike Pence refuses to endorse him. Yeah, which is a commentary on on not just his character, but his methods. Yeah. And, and so the tragedy is that many people uh, still fall for the idea of the authoritarian as being good for the economy or, you know, they love big infrastructure projects. Erdogan's always talking about the Istanbul Canal, the bigger the better. Mussolini built all the sports stadiums and so people were cheering him. In the meantime, he's killing people and look how they ended up. They lost a war and the people in Naples were living in caves, you know. This is so I tried to talk about the outcomes <laughs> that yes. that happen from this truly dysfunctional uh, form of governance. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because you know Trump's theory that if you befriend dictators, that you therefore protect your own nation from conflict is such a flawed argument. Could we just talk to that for a moment? Because you know that is something that we're hearing from MAGA Republicans all the time. Is that oh well? There was no new wars under under Donald Trump. That that in itself, a it's incorrect, but b it talks to the brainwashing that Trump mm -hmm. has successfully communicated what he wants them to think, despite the fact that it it's completely untrue. Yeah, it's completely untrue, and and the sad thing is that you know we know that. Putin, uh, who he's closest to, wants to destroy American democracy. And that's where we go back to, you know, if you are a Putin uh, or a Xi and you have imperialist ambitions, the power and the professionalism of the U.S. military is a huge problem, <laughs> a big problem. So what do you do? You insult the military. You try and domesticate them. You, you say you're going to withdraw from NATO. Um, you start talking uh, instead about uh, perhaps, you know, Putin and Xi and Kim are not our adversaries. And these are lines that, that Vance is also advancing. Yes. So it's, there's no doubt in my mind, if, if Trump goes back to the White House, America will be part of this autocratic axis. Uh, that's, that's where it's going. The price of that is that the military, now whether the military would do this, I do not know, and I'm not saying they would, but the plan is to partly use the military for domestic repression. That's why he's starting to talk about using the military uh, to, for mass deportations. And our state would have different priorities. You know, getting rid of 15 million people is like emptying out the entire population of Sweden or Bolivia or Belgium. It, it's insane. And the military would have to be involved, but then they're not being involved policing Putin. <laughs> so it's if you look at it geopolitically, a lot of the domestic propositions uh, and the rhetoric uh, make sense in terms of America being reoriented to uh, supporting autocracy. It's a drastic change. And that is why uh, Milley and Kelly and Esper and others are speaking out in these uh, very vivid terms using the word fascist. That's why they're speaking out now, because yes. they know all of this and they know much more. But I mean, they've taken their sweet merry time about it, though. And even they people have. like Bob Woodward have been sitting on information, especially that information that, that Trump had sent those COVID yeah. testing machines to Putin for his personal use. I mean, that information we could have done with two or three years ago. And, and you know, to sit on it for a book is an example of how there is a complicity in the media. It's a, yes, that, that's, that's, a, that's sad. It's sad. If you're going to put country and democracy first, you don't perhaps behave that way. We have to take another quick break, but I want to come back and talk about Trump's plan to overturn this election in just a couple of days' time. We'll do that next here on The Weekend Show. Lomi might just be the smartest appliance I own. It's like having an eco-friendly assistant that handles all my food waste. Lomi lets me turn my food scraps into dirt with a push of a button. It's a countertop electric composter that takes my waste and transforms it into nutrient-rich dirt in less than four hours. I run it while I sleep, just like my dishwasher. No more smelly bins, and it's so quiet you barely notice it's running. 
Since I got my Lomi, I'm taking out way less garbage. I used to struggle with three full bags of trash every week. Now I'm down to just one. What I love most is how much waste I'm keeping out of landfill. Less trash means less methane, and with Lomi, I'm turning that waste into nutrient-rich dirt that my plants absolutely love. If you're ready to start making a positive environmental impact and make clean up a breeze. If you're ready to start making a positive environmental impact and make clean up a breeze, Lomi is exactly what you need. Head over to Lomi.com slash weekend and use promo code weekend to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you go to Lomi.com slash weekend and use promo code weekend at checkout. Say goodbye to food waste and hello to a cleaner, greener kitchen with Lomi. And with the holidays coming up, Lomi makes the perfect gift for someone on your shopping list. We're back on The Weekend Show with Ruth ben Um Ruth, the polls have been neck and neck in this election. There's a lot of talk that the polling itself is stacked with Republican funding and that we shouldn't trust those polls. And that's very much my opinion, fingers crossed. But there is also a potential coup that is underway where Donald Trump, if he loses, as he did back in, in 2020, will reject the the result and claim that he is the rightful winner. And there is a chance that Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, is in, involved in this plan not to mention the legislatures and Trump loyalists who might refuse to certify. What are your fears just going into this election in a couple of days' time regarding this plan to overturn the result? I think that um, too many people have invested too much for too long to go quietly. Um, let's remember that Project 2025, um, which has been training people for years, uh, they call them an army of politically vetted civil servants. And the code word is day one, whether it's Trump saying, I'm going to be a dictator on day one, or Project 2025, they're talking about deploying the army of civil servants on day one. So all these people, um, and, and Project 2025 is made up of uh, over 100 organizations. This is thousands and thousands of people have invested for years in getting Trump back to the White House. So um, if he loses, they they already, as you mentioned, have all kinds of schemes to try and invalidate the election. And this is why um, GOP lackeys, i.e. senators and Congress people, have been going on TV and will refuse to say whether they're going to accept the results of the election, and including J.D. Vance, who just won't answer that question. Um, and, and because, and this is how you know they're no longer in democracy. This is an autocratic party that has left democracy behind because democracy is about recognizing free and fair elections, and they no longer do that. So they're going to try everything they can. We could also see, uh, you know, some repeat of uh, some kind of organized uh, violence around uh, January 6th if it gets that far. Um, so again, never underestimate uh, these people. But on, the, on the other side, there's been, uh, we went through this before, and there's been a lot of preparation and guardrails put up. And, and this time, he is not the incumbent. That makes a huge difference. He is not the incumbent. So, uh, so that's, that's how I see the situation. Uh, the downside to him not being the incumbent is that he could seek to take the White House by force and use this army. And as we know, there are a lot of Republican fans who are armed and, the, the, you know, there are the millions of AR-15 style weapons. I mean, you know, the, the yes. civil war that they talk about on the, on the social media chatter, they're, they're kind of goading for it to happen, though, aren't they? they they've always been goading for it to happen. They've been, the civil war... They've been talking about this, the, the most excitable, violent people for a long time. But, you know, President Biden is the commander in chief. And uh, do, there have been times when the Capitol or the White House has been barricaded. Uh, there are ways to do things to protect these buildings uh, so that that doesn't happen again if you are the incumbent and you are the commander in chief. Um, so that's a difference. That's different. Um, it's very hard to predict. 
but we we know because they're making it public uh, what all the different schemes, uh, the state level, the federal level, uh, that they're uh, hatching um, to try and uh, hang on even if they they lose. Finally, could you just talk to the to the antidote to all of this authoritarianism in Kamala Harris and the Democrats? Because you know she really is the the antithesis of all of this hate and all of this negativity. She is running on 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 hope and on joy and on turning the page and not going back. Yeah, this is you know it's extraordinary uh, how these are these two options that are. The, each one, the antithesis of one, the antithesis of autocracy, the other, uh, democracy and its promises. And it's, it's the, the progress that we have made. Uh, our economy is among the most robust in the whole world, right? The economist says the envy of the world. We have made huge pro- progress in really realizing the ideals of being a multiracial democracy, which is why at the state level there's been all this backlash to, to, to you know, make the history of racism vanish, make DEI vanish, all of that. Um, so I've been really pleased with the Harris Waltz campaign because just as uh, the Trump campaign's been rehearsing autocracy with the help of Project Twenty Twenty Five, what the Harris Waltz campaign's been doing is effectively building a kind of pro democracy movement. And that's also what the Republicans for Harris phenomenon, which I wrote about in my substack, um, I called it crossing the line. These are the things you, you have to do. And again, before we mentioned that we don't have a multi-party system, so we're, we're kind of fossilized. But Republicans for Harris is, is and, and, and Vice President Harris in a speech said, there's a home for you here. So there's been a way within the constraints of a, of a bipartisan system to kind of build this big tent of, for people who believe in our democracy in, in, to get us through this election. And I think on that basis, something new could happen in our democracy. Um, many, many people with the joy and the hope, I was thrilled to see this because I have a part in my resistance chapter about the power of hope, the power of joy. The Chileans had a march for joy when they were trying to get back their their democracy. So they're doing all the right things in a very difficult situation. And I'm looking at that not only for this election, but into the future. Okay. Fingers crossed. For now, Ruth Ben-Gett, thanks very much for joining The Weekend Show. Thank you. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism at patreon.com slash 5-Minute News. You can see more from me on the 5-Minute News channel, and I'll be back next Sunday with a brand new special guest and more factual news to discuss on the 5-Minute News Weekend Show with Midas Touch.